I like the hymns. Am I a little loud? Wow. I could, I could really bellow. I bet you Spurgeon wished he had one of these. You all know who Spurgeon was. He sp- spoke to big crowds. Can you turn me down just a little? <clears throat> all right. A couple things. We're going to take the offering now. Um, at the end, uh, and the kids are dismissed. At the end um, of the service, we're going to have the little kids come out, and they're going to sing you a song. They didn't get to do it last week, so we're putting them in this week. So you all need to know the sermon's going to be nice and short, so you don't have to sit there and suffer long, um, which everybody likes short sermons, right? Are you all awake? Well, you got to start talking. You don't get away with not talking to me during church. Uh, we're going to pray before we start because the subject matter is a, um, I don't want to say serious, but it, it is the subject matter. Let's put it that way. That sounded pretty good. It is the subject matter. It's what it's all about, what church is all about. I'm calling it back to basics. That's why I kind of was excited about the fact you guys ended with a hymn because when I think back to basics, I, I know you're not all my age, but Growing up in the church when you early days, it was nice. And when you're young now, when you're all old, you're going to say the same thing. Yeah, I remember when we sang these songs, and it was nice. And the preacher wore a tie and a suit. And <laughs> I've actually, I, I told you the story about the uh, lady that came up to me and said to me, you don't wear a suit when you preach? And I said, no, I only wear a suit when I do weddings and funerals. So one of the other older ladies in the church heard her. She was being kind of mean. So she came up to me and she handed me this check for $300 and said, go buy a suit for her. So, so I went and bought a suit and the next Sunday I showed up and the other lady came up to me and she goes, well, this is the first time I felt like I've actually been to church. <laughs> Which you got to laugh at that stuff. You can't take that personal. <clears throat> All right, well, let's pray. And we'll get started. Lord, I just want to say that uh, this day belongs to you and we belong to you. And I know that it is in the heart of everyone here that uh, you be glorified by what we do in our lives, Lord. I thank you for the fact that you forgive us, that your motive is for us. And I just pray that today, as we go through your scripture, that we get the full depth of what it is to be saved. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I said back to basics. Here's here's some things. I I, I question whether or not I wanted to give you this, but I'm going to give you this. Do you know that there's an organization, it's the International, and I have to look at it, um, Society for Human Rights. It's a secular organization. And their research has shown that 80% of religious persecution is against Christians. The problem is in America, we don't see it that much, but it's intense. One organization that does the stats has estimated that if you add up how many Christians have been slaughtered over the past few years, it's about 11 per hour that are being killed in the world. Now, you don't think about that stuff because your media doesn't show you that's going on. Problem is, media doesn't show you anything that's true, really, but we still think they're telling us the truth. But if you do this, as a matter of fact, one of the scary things is when I went looking for the research, you can get images and see the pictures of the carnage. So the church is under persecution. Something else that most people don't know, that in the evangelical community, we have 29,000 missionaries in the world. 29,000 missionaries. And the whole purpose of missions is to reach the lost, correct? I mean, it's basics, to reach the lost. What's interesting is in the Church of America, um, and that's the only ones I know because I don't live in Europe, so the Church of America, as far as I know, has this concept that the church is about fellowship, and it is, that the church is about Bible teaching, and it is. We also have this concept that it's about praise, and it is. 
But that is not the purpose of the church. We do fellowship. We do study the word of God to know what God has to say. We do praise and worship together, but that is not the purpose of the church. And I think a lot of Christians, and, and not meaning this as a rebuke, I'm including myself in this actually. We lose sight of what we actually are doing this for. And it's, it's real interesting to me. We'll get to a point to where our focus is entertaining the kids entertaining ourselves, the best music, the best Bible teaching, the best eats. I like saying that, the best eats. I mean, we get so focused in trying to build our little group that we fail to lose sight of what the actual purpose is. So we're going to look at that today. And to do that, I've got to start with the very beginning of time. Because if you don't go all the way back to the beginning, you'll miss a lot of the, the essence of what it is that God is doing. First and foremost, to understand the purpose of a church, you have to understand God's desire. You have to know what is it that my God actually desires. And if you think about it, it'll click when I say it. But it is to save the lost, isn't it? I mean, is that not his desire? I'll give you a good one. I love this one, and I stole it from John MacArthur. You have Adam's sin in the garden, and then you have God calling to Adam. Isn't that good? I've never thought about when God came into the garden. He said, Adam, where are you? He called him. Never caught that before. I don't know if you had. I hope you you haven't because that keeps me on the same level with all of you. I had never seen it. And what's interesting is when you get to the end of Revelation, he ends it with a call. Had you ever noticed that? Anybody? You can talk to me. I've never noticed that. And all the middle half of your scripture is him calling. Okay, you guys, you're not getting excited about that. (laughs) Think about that. All in the middle, I mean, he's calling people out. And if you see it in Genesis 3, You see that the moment where he clothes Adam and Eve, he covers them. His statement, of course, we all know of, I have to fix this. I have to fix this. I have to restore our relationship. You can't do it. And I love that answer. He, you know, the first blood was shed. He demonstrated. And then he explained to them, this is what I'm going to do. And he tells Eve, you know, there's going to be this battle between you and Satan and, you know, the child and all. I mean, it's all started right there. He states all the way at the start. He calls and then he states, my desire is to fix this, to save you. Do you ever think about that much? Do you? Good. I'm glad somebody does. You all are too quiet. I was worried this would be a serious message. So, You first and foremost have to understand the desire of God. You also need to understand the intensity of that desire. This is what baffles me about God, by the way. You have no need of anything. You are perfectly reasoned and logic. Your your emotional state of being is perfect. You're not irrational. You're not, I mean, God is perfect. And he has no real struggle. Yet he has this burning passion to save you. That to me in itself is enough to be a Christian. I mean, I can't, tell me another God that feels that way about you. But your scripture screams it at you. Uh, The intensity of God's passion to save souls. So what's he do? He he tells Adam and Eve, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to send you a salvation. I'm going to send you a Messiah. And then we go through history and you have Noah and you have Abraham. And again, he's telling it again. He's, and then one day he forms the nation of Israel and that nation's purpose. We talked about on Wednesday nights, those that come on Wednesday. Do you remember what Bernard said they were? You can say it. Oh, come on. Kingdom of priests. Come on, guys, that's it. I'm going to have to tell Bernard. A kingdom of priests. 
Israel, Isaiah 49, 6, please. I'll let you look at it. There it is. I want you to take note of what he says to them. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Don't, don't move past that too fast. The ESV says nations instead of Gentiles. But it means the same thing. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. That's what he told Israel. He told those people, you're going to be my people. And your job, Israel, is to bring the light to all of the people so they can be saved. See it? See the heart of God? Salvation's his motive in forming Israel. I'm asked all the time, what is this obsession with Israel? Well, there's some people that have a misplaced view of what Israel is. But the people of God, when they were obedient to God, were called to do exactly that. Did they do that? No, they started moving away from it, didn't they? They moved so far from it that they gradually started bringing in other religious ideas and doctrines into their communities. They started violating what God said they were supposed to do. They became internalized. Do you realize Israel became very internalized? It was, you all are over there. We're God's people. That's what they started doing. Got very arrogant, very self-absorbed, rewrote the rules, and then you had that 400 years of silence. And during that 400 years of silence, you got the Pharisees, the scribes, the Essenes. You started getting all of these religious groups that were forming off of what God originally had instructed Israel to do. It got so bad, and don't miss this, it got so bad that even though they knew what the word of God said, and they did, you see that when the wise men show up to talk to King Herod, And Herod asked the priest or the religious leaders, where is the Messiah to be born? Remember that? And they tell him exactly where he's supposed to be born. You've got a whole group of people that know. They know the commands of God. They know the word of God. Jesus says it to one of the the religious leaders. You know what it says. You should be teachers of this. You should, you know. They knew. The Messiah shows up. What did they do? Rejected, right? Right? Why? Because their religious ideologies, their structures, the way they were doing it, the way they wanted to do it, they weren't going to give up. Even though it was so clear to them that he was the Messiah. So now we move up and we're in the church age. That's us. And the church started, remember, back in Acts? And what were they doing? They huddled up in Jerusalem and they were all sharing things with each other. And they were all huddled up and they weren't going into the world and making disciples. They weren't going after the people. So God institutes the death of Stephen, I believe very firmly. Stephen had to die for the purpose of scaring the Christians so they would scatter And they scattered and they started going into the world because they were now afraid of persecution. Remember what Paul was doing before he became Paul? Saul was going around grabbing all the Christian Jews, throwing them in jail, stoning them. He was a part of all that. That scattered them. What is it going to take, you think? And I'm going to get you back into it. But what would you think it'd take for us to get motivated? Have you ever thought about that? Because right now you've got Christian, and I'm talking about in America, but in other countries, you've got Christians that are very motivated. You know what they've found? When Christians are under persecution, they do more evangelizing. It almost lights them up and they start working. I mean, I can't imagine being in a third world country where they're slaughtering them in the numbers they're slaughtering them. Yet Christianity is growing, especially in China. I mean, So in America, what is our problem? 
Is it, is it going to require something intense? I don't know. I'm asking. I really am. I don't know. I just know that the movement of the believers in the United States is muted. Not all of us. I can't say everybody. But it's muted. And the reason why, and please don't miss this, because we're concerned about fellowshipping, we're concerned about just Bible teaching, or we're concerned about praise and worship, whether I'm Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, or whatever you want to throw in there. We are more concerned about our religious dogmas than the desire of God, which is our purpose, which is to work in the direction of his desire. I've told you a lot of my stories about the churches. I used to go to broken churches and try and restore them. I trained to be a church planner with the Southern Baptist. And no, I'm not a dogmatic Southern Baptist, so don't panic. I actually went to work with the Southern Baptist to try and help the Southern Baptist. But I have gone into churches. I told you I had one church where the person flat out would not change. I mean, one of the leaders. I've told you about the altar call incident I had where one of the guys, you know, they came up to us and, and they said to me, we appreciate the fact that you're teaching the Bible. And all I was doing was teaching what Bernard taught me. And they go, but don't you do altar calls? And I said, no, I don't, because that was started by Charles Finney back in the 1800s, and it's not biblical. It's not bad, but I don't do it. The next day, they called me and said, we don't need you to come back anymore. But we loved your teaching. <laughs> it's like, okay. So we've lost sight. Now, those aren't bad people. I'm telling you that even, even the people that were not moving strongly in the direction of Jesus when he first showed up, they were God-fearers. They knew God existed. They believed in God. They had hearts for God. You see Paul talking about that in Romans. That's why he says, if I could, I'd die for all of Israel so you could be saved. I would go to hell for you is almost what he was saying, really. Because there were people that were religiously zealous for God. But they were wrong because they didn't understand that there was more to who they were as a people than just being Israel. There's more to the church than just being the church. It's missed a lot. That was all free stuff in there, by the way. Take us to uh, 2 Corinthians, please, Alan. I'm going to show you who you are and what you actually exist for. I can't convince you of this. My prayer today before church started is that the Holy Spirit would speak to you and move you in the direction of really getting this. I have been praying all week long that he would do it to me because I'm not claiming to have the market on this. I'm having to reshape my head and my thinking. Look what it says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Don't miss that. That's an absolute fact, okay? You are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us, what's that? I'm sorry, what's that word? Of reconciliation, what's that mean? What's reconciliation mean? To restore, to bring back. Look at this. God sent Christ to reconcile us to him, to God, the Father. His desire is for you to be reconciled. And then we are supposed to be ambassadors. Look at it. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. It is an order. It's not a request. It's a command. You are to be reconciling people to God. And then I'll explain it in more detail here. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You know what reconciliation is in a simple statement you've heard a million times? 
the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That is what you are supposed to be proclaiming. That is how people are reconciled. That is what you were called to do when you were saved. Do you agree? Amen. Dan, thanks. Yes. Yes, you are called to be people who preach the gospel of Christ. Now, I'm going to make this real simple because we're in a church that has lots of Bible teaching. Lots of it. We got more than most people get in a lifetime. Believe me, I've been in those churches where they don't know. But the one element that is the element and concern of God dominantly, first and foremost, is his desire to reconcile the world back to himself. Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? We hid from you, Lord. They sinned. I'm going to bring you back. He started with Christ. It's God sent Jesus. Jesus sends us. That's how it works. That's the heart of God. That's his desire. So as a believer, you should be thinking in terms of, okay, wait a minute. I really do enjoy the fellowship. I really enjoy the teaching. I really enjoy the praise and worship stuff. And the eats. Good job, Rob. Now, be honest with yourself, because I had to, so you all have to jump in the boat here with me. How are you doing with your purpose, your calling? How well are you sharing the gospel message of Christ to the lost that God is trying to save? Now, this is not to guilt you. Because that's a waste of time. Guilt only mo should only motivate you to move. It should not motivate you to stay feeling guilty. <laughs> it should motivate you to move. So the question that always comes up to me from people is, well, how do I do that? And everybody automatically thinks it's knocking on doors or deliberately thrusting yourself into an environment and walking up to somebody, Jim, I told you, Jim, the guy that used to go here years ago, or... Uh, a year ago, about a year ago, how he'd go run after somebody and say, hey, do you know Jesus? I mean, just shock them. They were like, where'd you come from? I'm not telling you to do that. And that may be what he's supposed to do. I don't know. But it's easy to share the gospel message of Christ, first and foremost. Your, your lifestyle, the joy of your heart, your attitudes, how you feel inside in reference to God's people. Listen, do you think God is passionate for the lost? Sure, you guys. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes, he is. He's passionate. How passionate was he? Well, we know what he did. He was so passionate for the lost that he killed Christ for the lost. So if I'm made in the image of God and I am now saved by Christ and I am to reflect Christ which is what we were told all the way back in the garden. Adam and Eve were created to reflect the glory of God. That's what it means when it says in his image. When you have been redeemed in the Holy Spirit and dwells you, your life should be very much along the lines of desiring and seeking out the lost for salvation. The more Christ-like you're being, the more you will do that. The more self-focused you are, the less you will do that. If you saw a little two-year-old kid walking out into the highway, what would you do? Oh, my goodness. That's how you should feel about the lost. It's that serious. It's that important to God. It's not about trying to get people in this building. It's about saving people from hell and letting God use you as an instrument to do that. Your lifestyle, your attitudes, that's the first place you start. The next place you start is when those moments come, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to tell somebody that Jesus loves them, that he died on a cross for them, and God's intention is for them to be saved from sin. You don't have to be a genius for that. 
I know of a guy that was down in Louisiana that could not read and write who would roll a stump over and stand on a stump and preach, and believe it or not, he had a crowd. And all he preached was the same thing over and over and over. The gospel message of Christ. Your purpose. Give me John 17, please. One of the things I started doing again this week, and I'm sure we've all done this at times, I just simply started asking God to keep sending me people that I can share Christ with. Just send them to me. You know, I, I, I talk about my wife's ministry and what she does, and, and I wish, you know, she's working on figuring out a way to bust loose from Sundays where she works, but that's hard to do in this industry down here. But there are two people that she's been with for 11 years that are now believers, and she never once beat them with anything. She just loved on them. And they started seeing it and started seeing it. She's got one person left, which is her boss. And Sue, I feel bad for Susan because she just, she wants to kill her sometimes. Because this woman is just so messed up in her thinking. Susan just keeps loving on her. What's amazing is this woman thinks of Susan as her friend. Even though this woman would throw my wife under the bus in a heartbeat. It's the, it's the Christian walk. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't be shocked if probably your worst enemy right now, if you have one, is the person you're supposed to be ministering to. That's how it usually goes. It's insane like that. I'll give you that. I'm going to give you a story real quick. I'll come back to this. I just, it just came to me. You'll love this story. I had, uh, and this is a classic example of it. I, had, I was working for a company in sales. We sold chemicals and floor care equipment to hospitals, Walmart, places like casinos. And this company came to me and said, hey, we want to hire you to come in here and sell for us. And this is what we'll pay you. So I quit. I said, yeah, I'll go. I'll go. You know, I'm going to get to sell bigger equipment, more stuff, more fun. I get to where they are, and, and they go, man, we're real sorry. Uh, we've decided we're not going to do that now. Uh, but if you want, you can stay and work on forklifts with the forklift mechanics. I've never worked on a forklift in my life. So I'm like, well, I don't have a job now, and there's no way they're going to take me back at the other place because I probably made them mad. So I'm like, okay, I'll do it. So I walk in with my little bag of tools. Now, if any of you know anything about forklifts, you don't have little bags of tools for forklifts. You have big tools for forklifts. And I walk in the door, and this guy that was in his 60s, long hair, hippie-looking guy, big man, looked at me, and he goes, who are you? And I told him, and he goes, well, what do you want? I mean, this is how he's talking to me. And I go, they hired me to come in here and work on forklifts. And he goes, where's your tools? I go, I don't have any. He gets all mad. And he points to this room over here, and he goes, you can go find whatever you want to find in there. Go over there and take that transmission out of that forklift. I've never taken a transmission out from a forklift. So this man is progressively treating me awful. We sit down to have lunch. I'm talking with this young guy who was 17 who had lost his mother. And this guy's name was Dale, and he's sitting with his back to me deliberately. And as I'm talking to this kid, trying to minister to the kid, he turns around and he looks at me and he goes, why don't you just shut up? That's what he did. And I'm sitting there going, okay, this is going to get fun. You know? So I looked at him and I said to him, if I have to listen to you talk about all the things you talk about that is just vile, you can listen to me some. Just wouldn't get off me. I know it's a long story. I'm sorry, but it's going to get good. What finally happened was is I knew I had to take him on because he wouldn't stop. So I did what I did when I was in high school and stuff like that. I waited for him to sit down on the floor on his bucket, and I went up and stood up on him. Well, any guy who fights knows you don't get up. So I've got him. And I told him, I've had enough. We're done. You're not going to do this to me. Get away from me. Get away from me. He's yelling at me. Get away. You know, went on and on. Next day, he came in. Hi, Dan. How you doing? Totally changed. Then he started to tell me why he hated God. Some pastor had told his wife to leave him. So Dale and, I, Dale and I start moving through just a series of conversations periodically. They finally fire me. This is the only job I've been fired from 
as a forklift mechanic. When they fired me, I said, what took you so long? And they laughed and they go, we kept hoping it'd work out. <laughs> when they fired me, Dale came up to me and he said, I would like for your wife and my wife, because he had remarried, to go have dinner with us sometime. We went and had dinner. I shared the gospel with him. A month later, he died. So now, see, good story. I told you it's a good story. It makes point. Your worst enemy may be the person you're supposed to be sharing Christ with. If you care about them the way Christ cares about them, you'll go to the ends of the earth for them. That's the way we need to think as believers. Now put John 17 up. Now, I don't know about you guys. I'm going to try not to, but when I read John 17, it always makes me want to cry because there's nothing better than what you're going to see right here. You're going to hear your Lord Jesus telling you what he's saying to God, what they're talking about. Look at it. After Jesus said this, he looked toward the heavens and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Don't miss that. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Know that, now this is eternal life, that they may know you. Don't miss that. What's eternal life? Knowing God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory. Big word right there, glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Did he give us work to do? Yes. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Next. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. That's you guys, by the way. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction. So the scripture would be fulfilled. Next. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world even as I am not of the world, of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, read it. What's your calling? That's good, Alan. What's your calling? You just heard one of the most passionate father and son discussions you'll ever hear. And the statement is, you have been sent into the world to do exactly what God sent Jesus to do, what he ordained to be done from the very beginning, and that is to be in the world for the purpose of saving. Paul made a great statement. I'm not going to do the scripture justice because I don't have it fully memorized. But I become the Jew to the Jew, the Greek to the Greek, the slave to the slave for the purpose of saving the few. Why in the world would a man so insanely walk into the middle of an area where he knows he's going to be stoned? with rocks. 
He knows they're going to try and kill him. Why would a guy get beat up so severely and then get back up and start talking to the people again about the gospel message of Christ? Why would a missionary go into a country where if they find you with a Bible, you will be tortured and maybe your kids will be killed? Why would they do that? Why would anybody want to be a Christian in a country where they would slaughter you? Why would they do that? I gave you the answer earlier. Because they love the people the way God loves the people. They desire for them to be saved and they're willing to die for their salvation. The sad thing, and I'll wrap up, the sad thing about being an American is we are preoccupied with our comfort and our entertainment. It's because we've been taught to be that way. We've lost sight of the mission. We've lost sight of our purpose. We have become self-absorbed, self-contained, selfish thinking people. I'm saying we. So don't think I'm saying you. We have. We have. Every single day of our life, we should wake up with that desire that God has which is, Lord, let me at least have one more opportunity to pull somebody out of hell. Let me be a part of your saving plan. Let me go with you and do this. It's not a lot of work, but it is a commitment. And a lot of us haven't made the commitment. Again, the way you speak, what you watch, what you read, identifies your heart. As a man speaketh, so is he, correct? If there is not a burning passion in you to have a heart for people, the way Christ has a heart for people, there's something incorrect. I got a gnat flying around. There's something incorrect in your thinking. And I'm not trying, again, I'm not trying to guilt you. But if you think about it, If you were designed a certain way, then for you to derive the full joy of your salvation, the best thing you could do is do what you were designed to do, what you were saved to do. The less you do what you've been called to do and designed to do, the more miserable you will be because you're not running the way you, because you're a new creation. You're not running the way you should run. You're a new creation. Y'all good? We need to get the kids to come in. I'm going to let you wrap up with something nice and fun. My hope is, though, and we'll, you know, we'll finish up. Can I get somebody to go get the kids, please? Anybody? Don, John, Jim, Bob, Bill. Um, you know, my hope is that you don't go home and just forget about this. My hope is that you get pumped up about the idea of, I mean, wouldn't it be nice to see God's face and he looks at you and he goes, you really did go out and try and save people like my son did. That's great. I just would love to see that on his face. I would hate to hear him go to this. Hey, Dan. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, I want him to go. That was great. You know, I'm not saying he's going to do that. That's just a picture I have in my head. So, hey, Dan, well, you made it. You know, I'm glad I saved you. You remember the guy that saved you? And he's over there, and God's going, great job. Are they coming? Okay. Here they come. Oh, another minute? I'll ramble a little longer. Boy, there's always wise guys, aren't there? But it's true. Yeah, let's, um, I think this year's going to be a good year. I think God's in, you know, I was, I come in and these are heavy things for me. When I start looking at the word of God and I start seeing God's heart, it tends to make me go, yeah, man. I mean, it, it's, it gets heavy at times. But I think this year is going to be a good year. I think it'll be a good year if you choose to make your purpose more resolved in your life. If your focus becomes predominantly that gospel, I think it'll be a good year. I think if you keep your focus on anything else, look, I, I don't watch news anymore. I hate it. It's just such a waste of my time. I'm listening to a bunch of nothingness. I'd rather sit down and talk to you guys. That could have been a veiled jab, you know. Are they here? 
All right, I'm going to turn it over to you. 